the reason we wanted to do this was uh, things are getting a little complicated for a lot of e-com businesses. They, they keep coming by um, as prospective clients or analyzing what people are doing and a lot of common problems that people are facing, a pre pretty crazy um, digital footprint expansion going on in the past few years. We've gone from managing six channels for clients that was 10 years ago to we're managing 15 plus channels now. That's super complicated. So what we wanted to do today was talk about how to calm this all down, how to distill some of this, how to make planning, execution, growth a little bit more manageable. Um, what have we figured out? And we'll try to put everything into context so that it doesn't feel like it's it's all kind of running away. Um, quick in, introduction to Exclusive. We've been around since 1997. Um, we typically have emerging clients, you know, people whose names you're starting to get to know, but um, a lot of established brands as well. Whoever needs performance, really. Uh, we're a performance agency, and that means you come to us because we we can figure out how to get your business growing in a healthy way. And uh, that's a real great boon for the market um, during hard times. Uh, I joined in 2008. It happened to be the first year that we were on the Inc. 5000. And if you remember, 2008, really tough economic year. But as a performance agency, we started to roll out new solutions that could help people improve the health of their business. So for the next 12 years, we were in on the Inc. 5000 for 10 of those 12 years. Um, and we started to develop a lot of different channel specializations. Um, I was uh, lucky to be brought on to develop our our specializations. I launched our SEO program, Google Ads, um, conversion testing, email, Amazon. I built out our strategy team. Our strategy team coordinates those specializations. And we, over time, started building technology so we could pull data insights from the technologies like um, SEMrush, Google Ads, etc., organize it in a strategic lens, and then guide growth, which has been really helpful as, like I said, we've gone from managing six channels 10 years ago to now just to keep up with our, our clients' needs, we're managing 15 plus. Part of just getting ahead of this though is data science. Um, since 2015, we've been building EDWs, um, enterprise data warehouses for our clients. So we can have all the data from all the different channels brought together in one system. And then we can use that for better reporting, for modeling projections and such, um, and for figuring out optimizations. And this has allowed us to also work really closely with a lot of different partners. And in that time, you know, we launched the Google Partner Program. We were the first partner in Google's Partner Program. And we're now the largest ad spend managers on the East Coast. We got to work with Shopify and Big Commerce, and now we're Big Commerce's marketing agents of the year. Uh, we are Clavio's top partner. As of yesterday, we just won the award for marketing agency of the year for Yachtpo. So these partnerships are getting really powerful. It's pretty exciting. Um, I'm always happy to be here. Uh, I've got uh, 17 days until my 15 year anniversary here. Uh, like I said, I joined when we were doing actually projects, just design and SEO projects, but I helped develop our services and our strategic focus. Uh, I'm also the host of our webinar series. So lots to cover though. And essentially why we're here today is, um, We've taken stock of some of the challenges that you guys are facing. And we'll run a poll real quick to kind of validate, you know, which of these are you facing? So first, um, obviously the uh, impact of e-commerce, um, the reliance on e-commerce uh, exploded during the pandemic. And then as people wanted to get out a little more or could go shopping in brick and mortar. What happened was we started to see an increased cost per acquisition, uh, higher cost per clicks, lower conversion rates. So that's, that puts a lot of pressure on a business that was used to operating at a particular efficiency and now it's contracting. There's a lot of uh, adoption changes. People are 
shopping elsewhere compared to where they shopped a year ago. And they're looking for new options. They're getting savvy about where to go. They're getting influenced by new places. So like I said, going from like six core channels to 15 plus because that's where customers are. There's also a lot of targeting issues, right? Because of privacy policies, you can't target the same way. And at the same time, there's kind of a, um, a flip side to that where each of the platforms is, is actually giving us more ways to target people based on their data. And of course, data is incomplete. What we mean by that is, if someone finds out about you on TikTok, goes to your website, then uh, signs up to email, gets influenced, remembers your brand name, searches for it, goes into SEO, comes back to the website, like it's everywhere. And how can you track any of that? There's no way to track someone from TikTok to website to email to SEO back. It just doesn't work that way. So you gotta have a different way of thinking about things. The old way of tracking doesn't actually apply the same today. So just a quick poll, like which of these things seem to hit home with you specifically? And it's a chance to kind of hear from your peers, empathize with your peers, because we're all kind of dealing with this stuff. Is it increased cost per acquisition? You could click multiple, by the way. Adoption shifts, where are our customers actually finding our competitors? Where should we be? We can't do pixel tracking as much. We also don't know where attribution we should follow. The data is incomplete. So I'll close this out in three, two, one, and let's Let's uh, see what everyone is thinking right now. So the the most common one here is is that most painful one, right? So like your business, your business is suffering. You may have been investing in Performance Max and maybe use some of the wins from um, high growth during the pandemic to invest in rebranding, uh, design, new channels. And right now, man, all, all you want is some performance. Just lock it in, get things tight again. 38% of you are saying adoption shifts. So where are my customers going to be found? Shift in targeting. And I like the fact that that's 31%. We're, we're all kind of agreeing at this point that yeah, privacy policy, I'm over it. And 42% of you are probably still concerned that you don't know how to track attribution in a way that is meaningful. So what we're gonna do is kind of go through ways to tackle all this. First, um, we're gonna talk about diversifying your investments. In a way that's not just channel diversification, it, may, it will lead to channel diversification, but a different way of thinking that makes your business healthier, grow faster, and these investments can help each other out. And we'll talk about segmentation and messaging. How do you hone in on activating the highest performance possible for each of your core segments? Now we'll talk about data science and how certain data science can help you activate smarter CPA targeting, cost per acquisition, um, and invest in a way that your next 12 months will be more efficient and higher growth. And then we'll talk about just some quick tips on tightening performance in the core channels. So we're gonna start off fairly philosophical, diversifying to hit your goals. And this has been a culmination of a lot of work. Um, trying to figure out, well, if we have 15 channels, then should we actually be looking at our investments as line items of 15 channels, where it's like SMS is being compared to TikTok, we know what we spent, we know what we returned, we don't really know who's supposed to get credit because everyone's attribution models are different. If you add it all up, 
the revenue is greater than the revenue we actually made. So that can't be right. Um, we decided to to change the paradigm, but we said, why don't we focus not on channels, but on something that we can all have a common language around. Essentially, there are five desired outcomes of marketing, and everyone knows it. The best part is everyone knows it. Everyone knows that marketing is supposed to get awareness for your brand. Um, it's supposed to get you people who are considering buying in your market, consideration. It's supposed to help you get past visitors to buy, that's conversion. It's supposed to help you get past customers to buy again, that's loyalty. And it's supposed to get your past customers to evangelize your brand, that's advocacy. And the reason we say everyone knows it is because, yeah, there are 15 platforms right now that you need to invest in, but every one of those platforms has audience targeting and features meant for awareness, for consideration, for conversion, for loyalty and advocacy. Every one of the channels has capabilities there. You talk to any branding expert and they'll say, here's the customer journey that we want to create for your customers. This is what we want to do in awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty and advocacy. Everyone thinks the same way. So that allows us to actually say, well, why don't we focus on these five things? If planning can be done this way, execution can be done in every channel this way, what else can we do? So we broke down marketing into these five areas, and we started to capture more information in those broken down ways. So specifically, what we've started to do for clients is tag every campaign that's meant for awareness or consideration, conversion, loyalty, or advocacy across any channel and start to summarize it. And we realize instead of just investing in like non-branded search and remarketing to get someone to buy, that's two pillars. Invest in five, diversify, make your business healthy because all of these help each other. Just look at advocacy. If more of your past customers are liking, sharing, and reviewing, that's going to get you more awareness. That's going to actually get you higher conversion rates. They all help each other out, which is why we call it a virtuous activity cycle. Invest in these five, and they will virtuously spin your flywheel. And while you're planning a customer journey, while you're executing using features of each channel, you can also pull all that data together in a simple view and say, what was my investment in awareness in the last 30 days? What was my return? What's my consideration, conversion, loyalty? How does that add up to my marketing efficiency ratio goal? And if conversion and loyalty are overperforming, doing so well, you can say, well, I don't need to do as well now in awareness and consideration because I, I have a goal in mind, and if those are overperforming, I can be a little lax in awareness and consideration. That opens up the floodgates to so much more volume of traffic. So this becomes an easy way for you to start planning, executing, and reporting. And we realize we need to make sure we've always got all of our campaigns mapped, awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty. But we also recognize we can't treat all of e-commerce the same way. So this is an important exercise for you to think through. What actually activates your customers? We'll start with brand-based journeys first. Maybe your, your customers are in a brand-based journey. A brand-based journey is for running shoes, fashion, technology, insurance, cars. If I went and I started searching for an SUV and a brand popped up on Google that I've never heard of before, I'm not going to buy that car. If I'm looking for running shoes, I'm looking for Hoka, Brooks, Nike. Those are industries where for some reason, people are brand sensitive. They need to know the brand. They may even search just by the brand name when they're ready to buy, or at least they're gonna to respond to 
those brands first. They might even find a brand on Facebook, love it, go straight to the website and buy, not even search. That's a brand-based journey. And the reason we want to identify is your customer going through a brand-based journey is because if that's the case, then what do we need to invest in for? Awareness. And anyone who comes to the website, conversion. We're marketing to them until they buy. And a similar cocktail of influence. It's going to be certain ads on Google, certain meta, TikTok, and Pinterest. Now, a search-based journey is different. This is the classic e-com business, right, where uh, your business is run on Google Ads, Google Shopping, SEO, Amazon. In your space, your customers know what to call a category of products. They search for that category, and they're open to any brand that shows up. But pretty much when they buy the product, they still don't remember what brand they bought. So like when I buy canvases for painting, I have no idea what the canvas brand is. I buy it from Michaels because Michaels showed up. And in that case, the success for a search-based journey is what is your search posture? When anyone searches for any category, any phrase that you could potentially serve them on, what is your Amazon, Walmart, Google SEO, Google Shopping, Google Search, Pinterest? What does your search profile look like? How strong are you? Are you holding that down? Because that search visibility is proportionate to your revenue. Your efficiency is driven by consideration, non-branded search, and then converting. You could still invest in things that are beyond that. Maybe you want to be the, the kind of well-known brand in a search-based journey. Maybe you're a brand-based journey and you don't mind investing in SEO and non-branded keywords because you're like, people know me well enough. I can now actually show up for these keywords too and it'll work. And there's tons of indicators that we can study. Um, give us any one of your websites and we can study them and say, we looked at you, we looked at your competitors, you're brand-based, you're search-based. So brand-based journey, we see like, Brand searches skyrocket at different periods. Why? Because these brands are investing in their name and someone goes and searches for them. They respond to branding. In brand base, um, when we look at SEMrush data for your website versus competitors, we see not a lot of overlap. On the paid search side, virtually none. Maybe a little bit more on product ads because that's just the nature of e-commerce. But if it was search-based, all these would be overlapping a lot. They'd all be targeting the same keywords because they're all focused on non-branded categorical phrases. When we identify a search-based for a brand versus brand-based journey, we then get to make choices. So 50% of you said cost per acquisition is increasing. Okay, so if cost per acquisition is increasing, then what you want to do is take a normal distribution approach. So if you're a brand-based journey, what you want to do is focus on a little bit of awareness, very targeted. Anyone who comes to your website, focus on converting them. Rely on your past customers to buy again. If you're a search-based journey and you want to really tighten things up, high efficiency, okay growth, then you don't invest in awareness because it doesn't really matter that much. Invest in a lot of non-branded search and then closing those visits. If you want growth over efficiency, then you've got an alpha distribution. Alpha distribution means that you're going to be the one business in your sector that's growing faster than everyone else. Your efficiency is lower than everyone else. So you did things that were inefficient but you're still growing faster than everyone else. And the great thing is you could, and we have, we're sharing our, our playbook here. We figured out for all the different channels and tactics, we mapped 140 tactics to awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty and advocacy, whether it's kind of low and contained, a little more aggressive and medium, really aggressive and high. So, um, everyone will get a copy of this within 48 hours, but here's some of the tactics. If you're doing awareness, this conservative, a little more aggressive, and then more aggressive. 
here's for consideration. Again, consideration is um, non-branded search. Someone is searching for something, you just want an ad bat, an ad bat with them, or they're in market and you're doing in-market targeting. Got loyalty, advocacy. And then we've shared this as well, which is after you've gone through this rubric, you should check yourself because there are a lot of channels to consider but not every channel is a good fit for your brand. Even if your search base or brand base and everything else seems to fit, there might be other things like the age of your demographic, the gender of your demographic, how many keywords you rank for and how many of those are actually ranking on page one, whether you actually sell on Walmart, whether you sell on Kohl's or Target. And this is the type of process we do for planning for our clients every quarter and when they first come on. The question is, you've looked at all this, do you, do you have a sense of whether your customers engage in your market in a brand-based way or a search-based way? How driven are they by, oh, I'm only going to work with the brands that I'm fascinated in, that I already trust? They are open to anything, search-based. What a different formula you have to take then. So I'm going to close this out in three, two, one, and all right. This is fantastic. Seventy-five percent of you believe brand sensitivity is not great enough to call it a brand-based journey that your business relies on visibility and at bats being there when the transaction is starting to get formed and then carry that person through transaction 18 percent of you are pretty sure brand-based seven percent are not sure and it's understandable why people might not be sure because Sometimes you look at yourself as the brand that it means a lot to your customers, but then you look at the rest of the industry and find out it's actually search-based. You just happen to be an alpha. You just happen to do the things that other people are not doing. That's the most confusing, not sure place. Folks, if you have any questions about this before we keep moving on, or you want to ask something a little more detailed or something unique to your business, go for it. Ask you in the questions section. Um, so next thing we want to talk about is segmentation and messaging. Why segmentation and messaging? Because across all the channels, you can still have a unified channel agnostic approach to segmentation and messaging, where you don't need to be stuck in the quagmire of 15 channels. The thing is that all these platforms, just as they are built around the normal five desired outcomes of awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, and advocacy, when they're building their platforms, they're also building around, wouldn't our users of our platform probably want to segment? Like, shouldn't we give them a lot of ways to segment? And you think about Google, for example, as Google ads has become less and less search targeting, because they don't give you the chance to choose your keywords, they won't even report on what keywords you're targeting. They're asking you, sure, invest in us if you're a search-based journey, great. We're going to choose the keywords, and you choose the segments and the messages. And if it works, if you segment it correctly with the right products, and you've got um, a good return, then we'll keep giving you more money. Clavio does it. Amazon DSP does it. The display targeting. Everyone does it. So. What we started to do was, why don't, we, why don't we figure out how to look at all the data across a client's entire investment strategy by segment one, segment two, segment three. So we got this process. Let's figure out what the segments are. Let's kind of coordinate customer journeys for each of the segments. And then we will tag all the campaigns and do a roll-up. And the cool thing about the roll-up is, let's say segment one, is massive. It's 58% of your traffic. Well, 
maybe you want to try a few different treatments on segment one, an A and a B and a C. So as all the A, B, and C campaigns have gone through ad spend and return, you can figure out, unbeknownst to your competition, how to take one of your segments and get a much higher return from them because you figured out the messaging that drives them. And we don't just segment because of that. There's a lot of reasons why we segment. One, wouldn't you want to know at any given time, if you have two or three segments of your business, what the size and the performance of your segments are? You've predicated your entire business on a belief that these are valid segments. Don't you want to know the size, the growth, and the performance? Don't you want to be able to target a segment with so many filters that you're actually eliminating noise and unqualified visitors? And don't you want to test and improve the response from each of those segments? We believe that's all important that we built for it. Now, how do you actually activate the best response? How do you test and improve? There's a lot of ways to go about doing this. But luckily, back in 3000 BC, the ancient Egyptians started to study humans and said, there seem to be like four different types of humans. There are people who are very social, they care about each other, they get a lot of heart. Um, yeah, people who are very logical and they kind of think in methodical ways. You get people who are spontaneous. They're, they like don't even look outside themselves. They're just like in the zone. And you've got competitive people that really want to be seen as the best. Hippocrates codified those four modalities into a science called humoral sciences back in 460 BC. And then when marketing science started to develop, we said, yeah, there's not four different types of humans. All humans make decisions in these four different ways. And different stimuli can activate us into a competitive modality or social or methodical or spontaneous. And this idea in the last 75 years has been harnessed into a lot of action where you can say, I've got three segments. Segment one, I want to know if my segment will respond to my brand because they see my brand as aspirational. Will they respond to my brand in a way where they're like, I actually don't know what I'm doing. Please help me. That's social. Will they come to the table with an idea of how to make a decision that's methodical? Or will they come onto our doorstep, see this amazing sale I just need to buy? And we developed all these ways to start figuring out what modality applies to each of your segments. And then we have 15 to 20 tactics that we can deploy based on these. So I'm going to ask you to think about your core segments and think, do any of these modalities apply to any of your segments? First, we do competitive. Competitive modality is, um, I'm willing to pay a premium price, but you need to give me a reason why that is valuable. Uh, when I see your brand, I want to see deep preservation of guidelines. I want some mystique. Be more image-based, less text-based. And show me who I will become. Spontaneous is, this purchase is actually really fun. I'm really excited to do something crazy. Or I cannot ignore these bonuses, these gimmicks, these discounts. A deal I can't ignore. And it could be really good for businesses with so much margin that you can play with it. Social, your customers come to the table knowing that they need to make a decision but not how to. So they engage with your chat, with reviews. There's a learning curve there. They need someone to hold their hand up that learning curve. They need a lot of validation for the brand because why should they trust you? They're still learning. It's sometimes a lot of work for one big one-time purchase. And customer service is something you have cultivated. Methodical is when someone's purchase is more technical in nature. They are aware of value pricing, standard, discount, premium. 
the one that's going to get them. And they're thinking like an engineer. And they need to know things like um, it's going to fit me. Those wheels are going to fit my tires. So I'm wondering if uh, if you guys are willing to to give it a shot. What do you think your modalities are that you're dealing with across your customer base? And you can choose multiple here. And meanwhile, I've got a question from Kenneth. Is it possible to be both a brand and search-based business? If so, how do you help clients determine if they should lean more towards search or brand strategies? So there are some indicators, numerical indicators, that help us identify if it's brand-based. If over 10% of your traffic comes from Facebook ads, if over 50% of your revenue in Google ads comes from brand search, if return visitors have twice the conversion rate or higher of new visitors, those are all indicators of brand-based. So there are ways to distill and, and figure it out, even if you're on the fence. I'm closing out this in three, two, one. So the most common modality is methodical. People have done their research, they know what to look for, and you've got to feed it to them. Oh, sorry, social is 59%, even better. That's UGC, reviews, chat, support your customers. Apple does a great job with that. Then methodical, right? I know what I want. I want to buy a great product. Samsung's phone line advertises purely methodical. 41% of you said competitive. I've got to get people to buy a premium product and convince them it's worth it. Um, Businesses like Tag Hauer do a great job there, and they even use like the prettiest, strongest, most successful athletes. All their language is super aggressive. And then you've got 23% of you are spontaneous. It's tough to be spontaneous in a bad economy. It really is, unless you've got great margins you could play with, or really good discount pricing that you can rely on, and you can activate a lot of buying. But it is tough if you had slim margins and you positioned yourself as a spontaneous because those margins don't carry enough. So um, it's always worth looking at that again. Uh, Kenneth, did that help my, my answer on the brand and search-based business? Um, hopefully it did, and please, folks, ask more questions. Um, embracing data science. Okay, great. Fantastic. So... As we continue to get into these challenging periods of the economy, um, it's harder to plan. And we, you know, if you ever try to do projections for yourself, like you take, take all your ad spend and revenue from the last year and you try to figure out seasonality and you try to set targets for the next year, it always feels like it's kind of guessing. But there's a scientific way to do this without guessing. It's called media mix modeling. So with media mix modeling, what happens is you you input into an analysis, a uh, multiple regression analysis, all your ad spend from every channel and all your revenue. And you line it up by periods of time. When ad spend in one channel goes up, the revenue goes up a lot. This analysis starts to uh, recognize that. And only when there's statistical significance does it start to output a result. Now, this is our media mix, uh, media mix model that we've been building for several years. Um, so I'll share that. There are a lot of other media mix models out there, but um, ours is free for our clients when they're on our reporting system. What ours does is it shows here's the revenue for the last 12 months. Based on improvements in trajectory, this will be the revenue for the next 12 months. This was your marketing efficiency ratio or tacos. So how much for all, from your revenue, what percentage went towards marketing? And say last 12 months, it was tough, but we made headway. And this is the new 12 months next year, much better. Now this also does something that I think is invaluable. 
it tells you of all the channels that were invested in, which one helped, which one helped a lot more and a lot more. In this case, paid social helped, but paid search helped seven times more in generating revenue, and product ads helped 12 times more than social. You say, great, so why don't I now go to my tool here and run a new projection for the next 12 months? I will not change my social investment. I'll up my paid search by 50%. I'll increase my product ads by 200%. Boom. It now tells you what your revenue is going to be for each of the next 12 months. And because of the way you you use the data, what you'll probably find is that the advertising cost of sale is going to go down. There's a 50% of you who said cost per acquisition is tough. This will tell you how to yield higher revenue at a lower cost per acquisition. It'll also tell you your entire seasonality over the past few years and what the ad spend should be per month, per channel for the next 12 months and what you're going to get from it. Science. It's fantastic. Um, we also developed customer lifetime value reports because, again, 50% of you said cost per acquisition is increasing. Well, have you ever considered that your cost per acquisition goals might be too low? How do you know what they should be? That was the challenge for us. So what we decided to do was start developing a much smarter customer lifetime value report that, again, is available at no cost to our clients in our reporting suite. Every client that's on is on reporting. Everyone who's on reporting gets this. So we can find what the customer lifetime value is over 12 months, what your cost per acquisition has been, net new customers. We can also take any snapshot of time, any cohort in a single month, and track that cohort. What is basket size on day zero? What is customer lifetime value by day 30, 60, 90, 120? How is it increasing? And all these numbers matter because the more you can get your 30-day and 60-day customer lifetime value to increase, the more aggressive you can be with your cost per acquisition. So the second part of this calculation or tool is here's your current customer lifetime value. Enter your current margin. This is your break-even CPA. And now set your cost per acquisition target at a fraction of that. So you've got an efficiency buffer that's using all the data to make these decisions. Not, oh, I'm supposed to have a $40 CPA. It has just crept to 45. Let's pull back all our marketing. That is a gut reaction. Because in most of those scenarios, had you done your math, you'd probably find out that you're Cost per acquisition should have actually been 60 bucks, and 45 is amazing. You just were looking at first purchase value, not customer lifetime value. You weren't looking at the big picture, and your business is about to suffer because you pulled back. Current reaction. Now, there's a lot of other ways to hone in on uh, cost per acquisition, and some of them are because your platforms that you invest in are making investments to fix some of their issues. And I think Google Ads has probably done the best job here. So there's a huge caveat with this, and I'll explain. Google forced everyone around last June or July to switch their smart shopping campaigns to Performance Max. You set a goal, they try to target it. Now, tricky part is if you use SEMrush and you look at all your product ads marketing month by month over time, if you see that the number of keywords you used to target were a lot, and then in June or July of 22, it contracted to virtually no keywords, meaning you're 
shopping ads are not showing up for like any keywords. Then you convert it to performance max, you did it wrong. And I just looked at one today uh, before this, this webinar. I was talking to someone who is, um, their advertising is being managed and um, they're using one performance max campaign for all their products. They didn't put enough media assets in there. You need granularity in your structure. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. And their visibility just contracted to nothing. If anyone in your space, in your competitive space, is running Performance Max and they've created a granular structure, meaning campaigns broken out by category, or maybe best sellers, and they're putting a lot of media assets in there, then that advertiser is getting all the space in Google right now. I want everyone should keep that in mind because nine out of ten accounts that I'm looking at today run by other agencies, they're all failing. And you got those like once in a lifetime winners. Some people have figured it out. But the reason we still love Performance Max is because when you do it right, performance is amazing. What Performance Max does is it finds people in shopping that are shot, like they're search based, 75% of you. Someone searched for something relevant to your product, product showed up, they get the click. You pay a lot for that click. Then they take that person, and when that person's on Gmail or YouTube or Display Network, they keep running advertisements on those networks for pennies per click to get them back to your website to finish the sale. Smart Shopping didn't do that as well. Performance Max does that. Performance Max takes a few extra pennies to continue to nurture someone all the way till they buy, which is lifting conversion rates, which is dropping cost per acquisitions. And they've done this because Smart Shopping had access to a lot of formats and Performance Max used all these vacant properties of Google that had tons and tons of activity but not a lot of advertising and poured all these shopping intent people into those ads. So just a little bit extra spend a much higher conversion rate. But only if you are the rare 10 to 20% of advertisers in your space that did Performance Max correctly. If you didn't, then you and all your counterparts have been pulled away from shopping pretty much. It's such an easy test to, to do in SEMrush. It takes 30 seconds to figure out. Um, we want to opine on some channels that are really going to change e-com this year. Critio Commerce, that's like Kohl's, Target, etc. Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Sephora, Ulta, or sorry, not Sephora, Ulta. If you're selling on those platforms, you can advertise in, in keywords now through Critio Commerce. There's a lot of SMS technologies that do different things but can be brought together as cocktails. You can bring your Yapo, your Klaviyo, all together into one system, which is pretty cool. Pinterest is taking off like crazy, but it's for search-based journeys. It's a social engine, kind of, but it's a search engine more. So if you're one of those 75% of businesses that are in a search-based journey, we have this way of studying whether your SEO competitors are also your Pinterest competitors, and it kind of connects Pinterest into your search strategy, which is phenomenal. For Marketplace, Amazon lets your rankings increase if you advertise your products outside of Amazon and you can track the value of those sales. You couldn't do that before. That's all through Amazon Attribution and Google Ads has a special beta program for that. We can advertise your Amazon product. You do all that because Amazon will let you rank better just because you brought sales into Amazon. So you make sales plus you win more organic positions. Um, and uh, PackView, so I got ahead of myself here. Critio Retail is, is for uh, for Target and Kohl's and Ulta. Uh, Critio Commerce is a display network, also fantastic. 
but it's meant for your website. My apologies, folks. And PackView is helping take Amazon accounts, duplicate the strategy onto Walmart, while adding sophistication in studying keywords, turning them to exact match, pulling them from your competitors, setting bid optimizations, setting day parting. So PackView is creating a boost in scale and efficiency in Amazon for those who have seen a contraction. And of course, conversion testing still undervalued. Last year, 40% of our tests were winners. You know, the uh, industry average is 10 to 12%. It's because we do modality testing, right? So we did a spontaneous test and it won. The next test is spontaneous. Why would we now switch to competitive? So we kind of find this track to keep following. Feed optimization still gives you a huge boost, especially if you have margin data, best sellers, or if you automatically can find trending products, which our feed technology automatically does all that. And SEO content is still just entirely underutilized. If less than 25% of your keywords are on page one, then you have an SEO case. So let's talk about some of that. How do you tighten performance? In the channels that you're most invested in, first let's talk about meta. So we're about to do a, uh, a case study webinar with a brand that spends a lot of money, right? Six, seven figures on meta per month. We increased their return on ad spend by 100% in four months. And they had some of the classic markers of why their performance was down. So one, if your ads are getting a, a, an exposure rate of 20 plus or anything greater than 10, I mean, everyone's seeing your ads at least 10, 20 times. You've basically broken meta at that point. Meta cannot qualify who should see and who shouldn't see when you let your frequency be that high. If your lookalike match rate is not like 4 to 5%, but it's around 10%, once again, you've kind of gone to a, a point where meta's qualification engine no longer works. So they're letting pretty much anyone see your ad at that point. Even though it's technically 10%, they're really not able to rein it in. And if you are trying to target cold audiences or past visitors or past customers, but your cold audience includes past visitors or your past visitors includes past customers and you have not clarified your targets, that muddies up all of Meta's learning. If Meta can use cold audience targeting, and some of those people are from your, your uh, have already been to the website, it changes the performance in a way that they believe they should spend more when they really shouldn't. There's other performance boosters. For Google Ads, like I said, if you want to be one of the few winners on Performance Max, what you want to do is break down your campaigns by product category, by best sellers of product category versus poor sellers. And if you need one more layer for segmentation, do that. You have up to 100 campaigns you can create in Pmax. You probably shouldn't use all 100, but you shouldn't be using one or two either. For discovery ads, discovery ads perform really well, but do it the right way. Your daily spend should be 10 to 20 times your cost per acquisition target. And then you need at least two weeks for your discovery ads to learn. If you fail to do either one and your discovery ads performance wasn't great, it's because you didn't run your discovery ads the right way. Give it enough time, set it up correctly, and discovery ads have great performance. SEO enhancements, pretty much across the board, most e-commerce businesses have their top navigation that has all their product selection pages. Product selection pages specifically should always have content. Most businesses have 20 to 50 pages, and you should write three to 400 words of content. When you write that content, use 
10 to 15 of the topical keywords related to your topic, but do not string your keywords together in single sentences. Don't use too many strong tags. Do not use too many crosslinks. Those are all over-optimization penguin penalties. Another major thing that can be done for probably 50% of you is to go back in time and find the last time you switched platforms because every platform has a big drop off in rankings, typically because something was done wrong. Redirects, faceted search, um, deleting content, rewriting title tags. On Amazon, Amazon's doing great, but do not just do product ads. Make sure you're using brand ads, which are at the top, and video ads. They both perform better than product ads. Utilize PackView to get more keywords and more efficiency, lower cost per click. And make sure you actually use targeting for awareness and retargeting for past customers. People underutilize that in Amazon. For conversion testing, if your cost per acquisition is getting higher, try increasing your conversion rate by 10, 20%. Focus first where most of the traffic is. Always do mobile testing because more of your traffic is probably mobile. And before you invest, always calculate your upside. If you could win 40% of tests and you do 12 tests, in a year, you're probably looking at a conversion rate lift of about 15%. If your revenue increased by 15% and your cost to run those tests was about 40,000 in a year, what is your return? If it's solid, you should be investing. If your core investments are strong, secondary investments for brand-based TikTok, for search-based Pinterest, for search base with a strong marketplace presence, Walmart. And of course, on owned media, email, and SMS, it's never too late to revisit your workflows, to see what your technology allows for personalization and AI, to get more integration into loyalty and referrals so that your, your advocacy component is getting stronger. And if email is getting expensive, diversify on to SMS where you can have cheaper growth. Now, before we close out, if you want myself or my counterpart, Liam, to study you, your competitors, your channel mix, whether you're search-based versus brand-based, what your channel mix should be, what your segmentation should be, if you want us to do deep dive audits on your Google ads, Meta, Amazon, TikTok, SEO, email, and come back to the table with, this will be your price, your team structure, your onboarding plan, the technology stack we're gonna use. We don't charge anything for this process. This is how we create better plans for more successful partnerships with our clients. We take our time get everything right, we modify it as we discuss, and when you're ready, we have a complete holistic plan that covers the entirety of being everywhere. And with that, I'll keep that up and go to the questions. Um, Bill has asked, what if you have a low CLTV and it's searched for, it's searched for when needed, not aspirational. Bill, that's that's a, a, a great business model. It is pure arbitrage, right? So you are trying to get only in front of the purchases where there's enough margin to get some profit on the first sale, and that's it. Um, they're all, first of all, that's that's almost entirely search-based, no matter what. 
Um, there's a lot of data science here at the feed level that can be helpful. Having your um, purchase value, margin data, break-even CPA, all calculated as, as three of the five custom fields available in Google um, feed could help you focus as much energy as possible, but also get back-end calculations. You could also do custom um, revenue tracking where the value that actually shows up in Google Ads is not the revenue number, but rather the profit of the sale. And with that, it's easier to manage return on ad spend against a non-expensive CLV, one purchase only, and it's got to be profitable. So you get a science of arbitrage. Hopefully that helped. Oh, Lauren, great question. Do you have any observations of generation segments in regards to the five phases of marketing and modalities? Like, for example, one must pay attention to advocacy if Gen Z is the target customer. Boomers are most loyal. Um, it's a it's a good question, but it it does continue to break down by kind of a combination as you're suggesting. For example, there are a lot of um, TikTok made me buy it buyers. But TikTok made me buy it for those of you who don't use a lot of TikTok. It is a hashtag people use when they made a purchase on TikTok. TikTok users are age 10 to 30. I know that's very young. Um, when they have money, they can spend between 30 and 50,000. Most of their purchases are low cost, spontaneous purchases. So in that case, yes, if you have a segment that is young and spontaneous, it kind of pushes you towards TikTok and that particular generational overlap is getting more and more active because it's becoming part of the generation, the generational ethos. So yes, there's definitely some truth to that. Awesome, folks. If there's no other questions, uh, we stop on time. I hope this was insightful and illuminating. Give you a, a chance to think about your business and planning in a different way. Maybe give you a, a potential partner that can help guide you through that. Uh, Lauren says, happy 15 year anniversary. You deserve a big raise. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, your webinars are brilliant and, and the best in the industry. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that, sir. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, awesome. Folks, thank you guys. Um, be in touch with a lot of you as you reach out. And uh, hopefully we can plan ways to grow your business with more performance. So. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.